My name is Joyce Gordon and I'm a volunteer with the Maria Rogers Oral History Program of the Carnegie Branch Library for Local History. Today, December 9th, 2004, I'm conducting an interview with Brigitte Mars, longtime Boulder herbalist, teacher, and writer. Brigitte, I'd like to begin by asking where and when you were born. Well, I was actually born in New York City, although I never lived there. I had a Russian Jewish father, a French Canadian Catholic mother, and my mother started labor on an airplane, and the airplane landed in New York City, so I was born there. What an incredible way to enter this incarnation. And I only lived there for a week in the hospital, and then went back to Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. And as a child, did you take a great interest in the outdoors and what was growing outside and all of that? Well, I love fairy tales, and in fairy tales there was often some sort of magic herb that could be used for a potion, so I did like that quite a bit, and I did go to a camp in Maine every summer, in Deer Isle, Maine, and remembering harvesting wild blueberries, and actually one of my counselors was Sal, of Blueberries for Sal by Robert McCloskey, and uh, we had a class called Camp Craft, but uh, a great passion of mine came from my grandmother who gardened and uh, had chickens in the backyard and did use medicinal herbs. Um, but I really lived in the suburbs and had a very manicured lawn growing up and uh, didn't know a whole lot about it, but I was interested in that there might be some power or magic there in those plants. Mm -hmm. And did you use herbs as a child? For no, not at all. I grew up back in the days of uh, the doctor would come to your house and give you a shot of antibiotics. And I was on antibiotics a lot for frequent ear infections, frequent sore throats. And uh, I think I probably went to the ear, nose, and throat specialist at least once a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish someone did know about herbs back then, but back then they just said, you know, drink a big glass of milk every meal and one, you know, white bread is wonderful and uh, just do it this way. But I was really sickly as a child. And how did your journey to Boulder come about? Well, I um, had, had done a number of things. I had lived in a teepee for two and a half years before coming here in the Ozarks and ate nothing but wild edible plants. I had a vegetarian restaurant in Miami called The Supernatural, and which was a wonderful little place in South Miami. And I lived in the Virgin Islands and helped open up one of the first natural food restaurants there in the early 70s. So in 1976, I found myself a single mother and really needed to do something with my life. And I heard about this school, the Boulder School of Massage Therapy. Back then we called it the uh, Rocky Mountain Center of Natural Healing, I, I think it was called. But uh, I had a boyfriend at the time who worked for Celestial Seasonings. And he was a roadie also for a very popular band at the time called Navarro. And he said, you should come to Boulder. People there are really into herbs and spirituality and holistic health. So I came out here for a Rocky Mountain uh, Center uh, conference, like a healing arts festival. And I just fell in love with Boulder. I couldn't believe the beauty. I was surprised because, you know, I, back in upstate New York, always thought that Colorado was way freezing cold. but. Now I know that the winters are much milder here than they were, than I experienced growing up. So I came out here, checked it out, and decided I was going to come to go to massage school and make something in my life. I already knew quite a bit about herbs, having lived off of wild edible plants, but I thought if I learned anatomy and physiology and nutrition and pathology, it would give me a good foundation so that I could raise my two children. And uh, back then in Boulder, as I said, I, I came here as a single mother with my two little girls. And in the 70s, you might remember that people hitchhiked. Mm -hmm. And so I would hitchhike to take Sunflower to Misty Mountain Preschool and hitchhike to Massage School, which was over by where Target's parking lot is now. And then I would hitch home to nurse the baby during break, hitch back to Massage School, hitch to go pick Sunflower up from Misty Mountain Preschool. What a life. 
And uh, after about a month of being here, this wonderful man gave me a ride home from a Navarro concert because the, the roadie had uh, kind of dropped me off, so to speak, and uh, he never left. Brigitte, what was your experience with massage school in those days? What was the massage school like? Well, there was certainly a lot to overcome people's impression of what massage was all about. And this was a very serious, studious school. I felt like some of my teachers were amazing masters. People like uh, Hal Paris and uh, you know, many teachers who've gone on to become rolfers and uh, Wynne Smith taught herbal medicine. And the, the days in the 70s, the massage school was really quite different. Um, nudity was pretty much accepted. We did rebirthing in hot springs. Uh, it was a wild time. And I don't know how much wild times you want to know about, but all the things that you heard about of the 60s and 70s, they all happened at massage school. But as the school got a lot bigger, uh, we had to have more rules and regulations. But I, I loved being part of that program, and I felt that I was getting a wonderful, wonderful education. And I now teach there, so it's wonderful to see that uh, the, the vision has continued. Way back then, Honora Wolf was the director. Honora Wolf is the uh, partner in uh, uh, Bob Flaws and also a wonderful practitioner of Chinese medicine herself. And of course the school was smaller, but I felt like I was getting a wonderful education and herbal medicine was taught there as a you know, six week long program and I thought that would be another reason for me going there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you anticipate becoming a massage therapist at that point? Well, I kind of thought that I could do that. But there were so many people who were doing massage therapy, and my passion even then was to talk about herbs and natural medicine. So I think that I figured if I had that education, I could do massage, but I wanted to have something else to offer, and that really had a lot to do with natural medicine. And I quickly uh, found myself getting fatigued with doing massage and, and telling people, you know, you really should drink uh, this particular tea, you really ought to, you know, cut back on weed or sugar, and people really just wanted to get massage, and I felt like there's plenty of other people that could do massage. I want to focus more on the nutritional and herbal aspects of health. Mm -hmm. Brigitte, what direction did you take uh, after graduating from massage school? Well, I met this wonderful man, Tom Pfeiffer, and uh, we went on the road for a little bit. We, he had a job remodeling department stores, so we traveled around the country. We went to Olympia, Washington, Kansas City, Missouri, somewhere else, uh, Missoula, Montana. But it was hard moving with two little girls because my children at the time were about six and one years old. and. I wanted to have some stability. So I, you know, as a, a teenager, I had gone to an all-girls boarding school, Miss Hall School for Young Ladies. And uh, I used to say to myself, someday, someday, I'm going to work on Broadway. And, and I did eventually. I worked on Broadway in Arapahoe, which was then Alfalfa's Market and is now Wild Oats. Um, so I, uh, I kind of had this feeling that well, I'm going to do something with herbs, but before Alfalfa's, there was another store. I worked at Cabin Country, which was a little store on 28th Street. And there I found myself bagging brown rice and organic candies. And um, it was a nice store. I, I didn't get to use my herbal knowledge that much. And I was really ready to just sign up to go to travel agency school. I actually was registered. I was going to go to travel agency school because I, I speak pretty good French and pretty good Spanish and I thought, well, that's some way I'll be able to afford to stay in Boulder and have some stability because the moving around thing was quickly getting old. I still don't like moving very much. What was your clientele like at Cabin Country in those days? Well, it, it, I love that Boulder always attracted people that love natural foods and that was certainly one of the things that made me feel this is a good community because when we lived in Kansas it was really hard for my children to be the only ones who had tofu or seaweed or even whole wheat bread was a little bit foreign 
So I figured if, uh, if we lived here in Boulder, it was just more mainstream. And I love that you could get products that you really couldn't find anywhere else. There was more organic produce here. But my clientele was people of all walks of life, everything from homemakers to students to uh, hippies to intellectuals, you know, that just great eclectic mix that Boulder offers and still makes me very glad to be part of this community. Mm -hmm. What happened after Cabin Country? Well, I was just about to go to travel agency school when I got a call from someone I consider a very dear friend and mentor, John Hay. And John Hay was one of the founders and political backers of Celestial Seasonings. And he said, there's a job opportunity at Pearl Street Market. And I think you ought to apply for it. And Pearl Street Market uh, is now, well, it doesn't exist any longer, but it was on Pearl and 18th, I think 1825 Pearl Street. And uh, back then, that was considered a really big health food store. I think this is maybe 1980, 1981. And uh, I wrote up a resume, and John Hay said, you can't write all this hippie stuff about living in a teepee and giving birth in a teepee and, you know, being uh, your kid's godmother's uh, Timothy Leary's wife and, like, leave all that stuff out. They don't want to hear about that. And he, like, tore my resume in half and um, made me write it again and tore it in half again. So says, no, 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 no. So after, like, three tries, I finally got the resume right. And I applied for the job at Pearl Street Market. And back then, you know, they had a really nice herb section. It was one of the first stores that really offered bulk herbs. And they wanted someone to educate people about herbs because the herbs really just sat there. There wasn't enough knowledge. And um, I, I think they did something like $60 a day in herbs. And so they wanted me to come and talk to people and do demos. And they really were one of the first health food stores, to my knowledge, that had someone kind of walking around the store assisting people, helping them figure out what's a good vitamin for your child and you know what might some helpful remedies be. So I'm very grateful because Haas Hassan and Mark Retzloff, uh, who started Pearl Street Market, they also started uh, Rainbow Distributing Company in Denver, uh, hired me and became wonderful allies and I think we made a really great team. I'm grateful because they believed in me and we got to stay in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when Alfalfa's opened up a few blocks away, I moved over to there. Right about the, that same time, Hannah Kroger had an herb company and she was kind of a Boulder legend. She also ran New Age Foods uh, which was a vitamin and supplement and herb store and then upstairs they had the all you can eat for a dollar five lunch and Hannah used to counsel uh, some of her customers and recommend certain uh, remedies and eventually uh, she was charged with practicing medicine without a license. Can you give us any more details and did anything like that, uh, w were you afraid that something like that might happen to you? I certainly remember <clears throat> New Age Foods and love those inexpensive lunches, delicious lunches. <clears throat> and I remember that people would just line up for blocks down the mall to have just a few minutes with Hannah Kroger. I did get to take a few classes with Hannah, um, although interestingly enough there was a time when my daughter Sunflower was really good friends with her granddaughter, and she came to the house quite a lot, Helena. But um, I remember when Hannah was cited for practicing medicine without a license, and it really did put fear and concern into me because I thought, well, who's next? You know, and Hannah is this old, respected, you know, woman who's, uh, I believe, even a nature path, that the same thing could possibly happen to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what I've always tried to do is bill myself not as treating people or curing people, but that I'm educating people. So if someone calls me up and says, you know, do you heal fibromyalgia? I say, I, I don't really heal people. I do one-on-one -on -one health education seminars to educate people so that they can take better care of themselves. So I think a lot of it is in the wording. And of course, I taught 
classes and still teach lots of classes because I really don't think you can cure anybody else. You can help provide the right situation so that the body will heal itself. So I've always kept it very much under the guise of educating people and I really don't diagnose and most people who come to see me already have an idea of what is going on with them. But I remember that Hannah ended up turning her practice into part of her religion because she moved her practice I believe into Niwat and people would come to church and that you could heal within the guise of the church. So I remember thinking uh, I should get my minister license, my minister of divinity. So I got one of those just in case I needed to use that card. Not that you know being connected to divinity is uh, not, it's a wonderful thing so it wasn't like a hard leap but um, education really has been my way of getting the message across and I've often felt that what I was providing was helping to be a liaison between the, the plant kingdom or queendom as you might call it and people and helping to get people to recognize that very often the medicines that they might need might be growing in their own backyard and that certainly diet is a big part of why health might go awry in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have any customers come back and say that uh, a remedy or a supplement that you suggested didn't work for them? And Well, one of the things that I always did at Alfalfa was I asked people, please let me know how this works for you. Because I wanted to know. I wanted to know what worked and what didn't work. And I was always changing things based on, you know, I... 80 people this month told me that this was a great hay fever remedy, so um, this is what I'm going to recommend. And I had, you know, five people say that this remedy didn't work. So I certainly did um, have customers help me to figure out what was the best product. And of course, not any product is going to work for everybody, and different people have different constitutions. But I learned a lot by doing those little five minute consultations with people and I just always ask people my name's Brigitte I'd love to hear how this works for you and uh, you know I want to know if it does work or doesn't work because I really need to know I can't take all of these remedies myself and I don't have all, all the ailments that these remedies are made for so I'm very grateful for the kind people that came back certainly there were things that didn't work and one of the things the doctors often say is the most difficult for them is patient compliance and I'm big on it's not enough just to take a remedy, an herb, a vitamin. You need to look at lifestyle things as well. So if someone can't sleep, yes, I could sell them a bottle of valerian and hops and chamomile and skullcap or kava kava, but it's also good to look at, well, why can't you sleep? Is it because you drank a lot of coffee during the day? Is it because you're eating late at night? Is it because you have too much on your mind? Is there too much light coming into your room? Um, what about doing an aromatherapy bath before bed? So I think one of the things that people really liked about how I helped them was I gave them some lifestyle ideas that would make whatever they were buying work even better and help them see how their lifestyle was contributing to whatever condition they wanted to improve. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the process of becoming a minister. Did you do that here in Boulder? Oh, it was some little, you know, fi fill out some papers and things like that. Although my spiritual path has certainly been a big part of my life. I've long been a Urantia book reader. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, so this, the minister thing was really just to get some documentation so I could perform marriages or, you know, baptisms or something like that. Did but you do any of those? Um, yes, I have spoken at a number of marriages, but you know, I've, I've, there was actually a little Celestial Seasonings tea tag that I always liked a lot that said, um, cut out the middleman, deal directly with God. So, you know, I think, you know, you can always just have a direct line too. Mm -hmm. But for ceremony things, you know, baptisms and, and weddings, yeah, it's nice to have someone. But in the state of Colorado, really anyone can marry you. When you were at Alfalfa's, were you also um, uh, involved with the Rocky Mountain Center for Botanical Studies? When did that come about? I believe the Rocky Mountain Center for Botanical Studies started, I'm going to say 1991 perhaps, and interestingly enough, Feather Jones, 
who I went to massage school with and who is really one of my closest friends at massage school is the founder of that school. So uh, the school started and there were only a few herbalists in Boulder and so Feather asked me if I'd teach at the school and I was delighted because so often to teach uh, you know, good classes, long classes, I would have to get on an airplane and, you know, fly to Memphis or some other state. And so um, the Rocky Mount Center for Botanical Studies opened up and it was actually on Arapaho, around 55th and Arapaho. And my daughter Sunflower, who was then maybe 19 years old, said, I'm going to go there. That sounds great. And I was so happy that one of my kids wanted to go to herb school because I just felt what an amazing thing for this tradition to carry on something that my grandmother had inspired in me that my daughter would want to continue to learn about herbs and I didn't think I should be her only teacher I thought you know you need to learn other things from other people mm -hmm. I also was wondering about uh, your two daughters and their names and uh, did they have to endure any teasing in Boulder or was Boulder um, uh, alternative enough that uh, nobody made fun of their names. Well, I did, you know, true to hippie form, name my daughter Sunflower Sparkle Mars and Rainbow Harmony Mars. And that was another reason why living in Boulder was a lot kinder than living elsewhere. Um, I know for a while Sunflower's best friend was named Earth Star. And uh, I kind of decided when I was pregnant with my children that kids are going to make fun of whatever your name is. If you're Charlie, you're going to be Charlie Brown. You know, though, I was Bridget the Midget, you know, in uh, growing up in elementary school. So I kind of figured they're going to make fun of your name anyways. And there was a time when Sunflower was going to Baseline Junior High, and she asked if I could tell them her name was Sunny. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting because a few years ago, Sunflower who now has a degree in early childhood education, went for a job interview at Sunflower Preschool. And when she walked in for the job interview, they were studying Mars. So there were like pictures and mobiles of Mars everywhere. And of course, Sunflower Mars got the job at Sunflower Preschool. And uh, Rainbow, she got called Rainbow Bright, who was a little cartoon character back then. and. Uh, she kind of used her name to move herself forward. She uh, started modeling at about age 15 or 16 years old and Rainbow Mars was a name that got noticed and when she was I think 19 years old she got a part in an Oliver Stone movie, The People vs. Larry Flint. And you know in the competitive world of acting um, having a name that is unique and I think my kids also got asked a lot, so your names are Rainbow or Sunflower, were, were your parents hippies? And they would always say, were, but <laughs> I, I kind of like to rephrase that and say, you know, I, I'm probably more of a zippy, hippies with zip, hippies that have computers and create businesses and help create social change and don't just, uh, you know, laze around, but someone with a, a lot of zippy type energy. When did you begin your herb walks? Well, I remember going on an herb walk with someone else, maybe in 19, I'm going to say 79 or something like that. And there were so many herbs that she did inaccurately, you know, confuse things. And I just said, and I was trying to be polite and not overshadow the teacher. So I said, I'm going to start doing herb walks because I, I think I know a lot about these. And again, the, the two years that I lived in the teepee and ate nothing but wild edible plants and not once went to a store um, gave me this sense of you know, how important it is to get reacquainted with your herbal allies. People walk around and they think, oh, it's just a bunch of weeds. And yet it might be a plant that could stop bleeding or be life-saving. And a quote I heard once is that the average American recognizes less than five plants or five birds in their area. And of course, here people recognize an herb like dandelion and they think, got to get something to mow it down. That. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to help educate people that the herbs really can be our allies and provide free food and medicine and that we should learn to respect them and use them. And, uh, another thing that I'm very big on is that 
uh, freshness in food is really important and that much of the produce people eat have been harvested maybe six weeks ago and so the idea that you could go in your backyard and harvest a salad of things that were just growing a few minutes ago imparts into you an amazing vitality an amazing spark of health so I wanted to get people to know that you could do that in the TP days how did you know which plants were edible and uh, what you could survive on well as I said, I, I went to an all-girls boarding school, Miss Hall School for Young Ladies. Um, and soon after that, I found myself living on a commune in Reynolds, Missouri. And there weren't a lot of books back then. I remember one book, Stalking the Wild Asparagus by Yule Gibbons. And I read that book and I would go to the library, you know, are there any other books? And there were a few books, um, but most of the books would identify the plants but not talk about edible uses. But there were hillbilly people around that area. And I remember this one old hillbilly woman, Mrs. Glore, and she was such a kind, generous spirit. I would go and help her with whatever work in the garden. And she taught me that almost all of the so-called weeds were actually edible plants. So I would go out and um, work in my garden later on and have a colander with me. And rather than just like weeding, I'd say, but I'm pulling purslane for tonight's soup. I'm pulling lamb's quarter for tonight's salad. And I learned that you could have two to three times the yield of your garden. And I really think that this is such big news that people should wake up and with rising costs of food, I think we should all be supplementing our food as well as our health with free, wild, delicious, and the most nourishing plants on the planet are some of the wild things. So um, I will give thanks to old Mrs. Glore for teaching me about wild weeds in the Ozarks. And then of course in more recent years there have been many books. And any other old-timer mentors uh, that in this area that have helped you out with that? Well when I came to Boulder there even though I was going to massage school and a nursing mother and a mother of a uh, you know, preschool child, I was tired, but there was a wonderful teacher in Boulder at the time named William Lasassier. And so in the early, early time in Boulder, um, Green Mountain Granary was the, the happening store on Arapaho, which is now Boulder Senior Center is there. Mm -hmm. But William Lasassier taught classes somewhere out east and I would go to school in the daytime and at night I would go sit at William Lasassier's feet and he ended up being an incredible teacher and I would just like oh someday I wanna be like him and we ended up becoming very good friends and uh, staying in touch and he would come through town and visit often and I um, I love William Lasassier because he had a wonderful integration of Western herbalism and Asian herbalism and he had a wonderful skill of diagnosing people and he was he was somewhat dyslexic so he he would read people more than he would read books so I am very grateful for his wisdom when did you start taking others on the herb walks I'd say probably around the time I started working at alfalfas I would meet people and um, they would want to come on walks and I love doing it because even in my life, you know, it's hard for me like not to walk down the street and, and notice plants. So I would take small groups and um, would make up flyers and I pretty much did the herb walks at Mount Sanitas. There was a time where I did them at Chautauqua Park, but I found that Mount Sanitas was a nice easy walk and that there were plenty of available plants and kind of several different terrains there to choose from. And to this day, I still do herb walks. And I remember someone saying, um, did someone come and plant all this stuff here? And I said, no, this is what happens when you just leave it alone. And another thing that exemplifies the strength of the herbs is that no one came here and watered it. No one came here and put fertilizer down. This is what happens when you just leave nature to do its own thing. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly rich. You. Uh, spoke in an article uh, in the Daily Camera in 1984 about how you would examine 50 to 75 different varieties of plants or herbs um, in a typical herb walk. Are there those varieties still existing and do new varieties ever develop and how does that all work? Well, 
plants do seem to come and go for a period of time. And a lot of the herbs that are considered noxious weeds, even on the Boulder County noxious weed list, well, I think we need to re-examine that because St. John's wort is one of those so-called noxious weeds. And yet, why should it be legal to go buy a bottle of St. John's wort and yet you really aren't supposed to plant it in your garden and you're supposed to eradicate it if you see it growing. But of course, in recent years, St. John's wort has become the, you know, one of the best herbs for helping mild to moderate depression. Um, and thistle is another noxious weed. Um, and there's quite an invasion of thistles, a, a wide variety of thistles. But I see that plants like thistles, which are kind of spiny and uh, unpleasant to step on, I feel that they're here to help heal the earth. And very often when an area has been clear cut or mowed down or altered in some way, like a creek path change, that uh, prickly or dangerous plants will grow for a period of time to give the earth time to rest. I do believe I've seen an increase in poison ivy. And as another one of my friends and teachers likes to say, poison ivy tends to grow where the earth has been cut by metal. Mm -hmm. So it may be that some of these plants are growing for a period of time to give the earth time to rest and recover from some assault on it. But um, there certainly are endangered species. And uh, with this growing interest in herbs, I you know, don't collect things on the herb walks. I try to educate people that these things are in your own backyard. Um, you should plant them if they're not. These are plants that will grow easily here. Uh, visit the local farmer's market and ask what will grow in your area. You know, If you live at 10,000 feet and you have nothing but shade or nothing but full sun, uh, talk to some of the people that offer seedlings at the farmer's market that they're great to inform you of what is going to thrive well in this environment. Um, I have a little personal agenda. I'm trying to get the herb stinging nettles very well established and every spring I give hundreds of nettle cuttings out to people that are already rooted and I tell people please plant nettles I think everyone should have a stinging nettle patch in their yard and I know you think well that's really horrible they sting you but the sting will help to treat arthritis and fibromyalgia and uh, nettle tea is good for your bones your teeth your hair it's one of the most mineral rich herbs. And so I'm seeing little patches of nettles, but I think that um, I'm helping that along uh, a little bit. Um, Who was determining the, what uh, plants were noxious in those days? Well, you know, I, I'm sure there's some sort of weed control board. And I do want to say that uh, Boulder is a county that really has looked towards alternatives. We're doing a lot less spring in areas, but we need to do even less. Um, spraying school grounds, I mean, what's wrong with a few dandelions growing on a school ground? It's much more dangerous to have herbicides and children being together. And what about having public parks sprayed? So um, I know that there's uh, one person in particular, uh, Randy Weiner, who's a lawyer, who's done a lot to really help raise awareness about the dangers of herbicides. And um, I feel like I try, I try to help him however I can. But uh, I, I, there is some kind of board that determines this. And I can see why poison ivy's on the noxious weed list. Um, but thistles are actually wild artichokes, and if you were in a survival situation, you should uh, dig up a thistle and eat the roots or peel the stem. I, I actually think it would be a great thing for homeless people to learn more about wild edible plants, because if I could live for two and a half years without ever going to a store, I really feel that one doesn't need to go hungry. Mm -hmm. And almost everything has a purpose. There's a few poisonous plants, yes, but it's a lot easier to learn what those are, like poison hemlock we have in this area, poison ivy, death camas, but most of the plants are really quite beneficial. The Mount Sanitas Trailhead uh, has developed into one of our most popular ones, and um, do you think that the population growth and the amount of traffic that that trail gets has changed the nature of the trail in the last 27 years? Well, I do see a lot of people keeping to the trails, which I think is wonderful. 
And I know it's a place where people like to go and walk their dogs, and I would just please ask people, clean up after your dogs. It's very unpleasant to lead an herb walk when people don't clean up after their dogs. So, um, you know, just take it from me that it's nice when the, the trails are kept clean. And yes, I think it's great that the dogs can run free there. But um, I, I still see a lot of the same plants blooming in the same place. And I, I think that's really good news, and I think that one of the things that makes us love Boulder is that people tend to be more environmentally conscious. Mm -hmm. We've had recycling a lot longer than many other communities, and a lot more people that follow through and do it. For the record, do dog feces, how do they impact uh, the plants that are growing? I, I think it's more just a, a aesthetic mm -hmm. thing. Um, I think that in general, you know, uh, any type of uh, fecal matter can be used as fertilizer, but, you know, if the dogs are eating a, a diet that's, you know, not really a, a healthy diet. Although I was walking on Mount Sanitas um, just a few weeks ago and saw a big pile of purple feces, and I said to my husband, bear poop. Let's get up, let's move, because it was, we were kind of on an off trail, and so dogs don't eat all the um, choke cherries and uh, berries that the, the bear do. So it was an obvious sign that the bears had been there. How did you uh, develop the idea of doing the herb camps for kids? Well, my daughter Sunflower um, felt that one of the best parts of her childhood was that we did a lot of herbal crafts. So even though I was a working mother, I came home and I made healthy food and um, I always tried to do some kind of crafts with my kids. We'd make our own cosmetics, we'd make hairspray and facial scrub, we made our own holiday presents, dream pillows and bath salts and sleep pillows and um, lavender wands and Sunflower said, I don't want to stop doing this because I'm grown up, let's teach it to other kids. And um, so, and she had gone to herb school and a lot of her focus was even on children's health uh, back then. So uh, it was really her idea. And for the past five years, we've done herb camp for kids and had maybe 20 to 25 kids for three days. It's a day camp. And we make wild salad and we make all healthy food and um, really teach the kids survival skills, first aid, and. Uh, I, and a lot of kids have come back every year. I don't believe we'll do it this year because Sunflower has a newborn baby mm -hmm. named Solwyn. So I think she needs a little time just to get accustomed to all that. But hopefully we'll start it up again soon. So you were teaching at the Center for Botanical Studies. You were doing the herb walks and herb camp and um, also other workshops in the area? Yes, I've long taught a 10-week workshop at my home right here in this living room. Mm -hmm. I also teach at Naropa. I teach a whole semester every fall there, which and I love my students at Naropa. Um, How long have you been teaching at Naropa? Um, probably about 10 years. I've had some little breaks in between, but the students there are such creative people and it's just wonderful. And I now teach at a, a place called Esalen in Northern California, which I've always wanted to teach there. So um, that's, was one, you know how you have goals in life, like someday I want to teach at Esalen, so yes. The I, old Esalen Institute from yes, in Big long Sur, ago? California, it's still happening. Yeah, it really is. And I teach in other places where they ask me to. I sometimes am a guest teacher at CU. Mm -hmm. um, but those are some of the most frequent things that I do, and I still have my radio program on KGNU. Uh-huh. Your radio program started when? Well, Tammy Simon, who is the founder of Sounds True, um, the wonderful recording studio that tapes the voices of all kinds of wonderful movers and shakers on the planet, um, suggested that I start a radio show. And I think it's been more than 20 years ago. So it might have been like 2001, 2002. And she helped me pick out a theme song, which we still use. And um, back then, KGNU was on Broadway and Spruce or Pine? Spruce. Spruce Street, upstairs of the Aristocrat Restaurant. And so I would run over from Alfalfa's and do the show live. And now I record my shows uh, usually six weeks in advance and uh, Sam 
um, helps me to uh, do all the, you know, all the technical stuff. So, um, I, yeah, I've, I've done the show, and I'm so grateful because KGNU is really a voice for the people of Boulder, and mm -hmm. they were giving me the space to talk about echinacea or medical marijuana or any of that stuff long before those were really issues that were in the public eye. Mm -hmm. Did you get a lot of people calling in uh, to give feedback on your shows? And I, we definitely have gotten calls on the pledge drives, and you know one of the reasons why I keep doing the show because I'm a volunteer, like so many KGNU volunteers, is when nice people say, "I love your show. I learned something. Yeah, I did. You know, I tried an herb or I changed my diet some way, and I uh, took something to heart." So thank you, KGNU, for being there. And now they're broadcasting into Denver, which is great. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your own tea company and I want to take just a little time to uh, get the tea canisters so that the viewers can take a look. Okay. Okay, we are back with Brigitte and her husband Tom. Brigitte, uh, how did you two hook up? Well, this is Tom Pfeiffer. Hello, folks. And he's from Pensacola, Florida. And 27 years ago, he gave me a ride home from this rock concert. Hadn't gotten around to dropping her off yet. And we've been married 25 years. We just had our 25th wedding anniversary. And he is such my hero because as I told you all before I came here as a single mother with a six month old and a five year old. And Tom has been an extraordinary father and husband and partner. And I'm just so grateful. I feel like the universe gave me another chance. And there should be more like him in the world. And how did the tea company come about and how did you two uh, begin and run the tea company and when did that start? Well, it was 86. 1986 and Tom was pa hanging wallpaper and painting you know, and in the construction trade at the time. And the chemicals were making him sick. And uh, one day, uh, Alfalfa's Market was having a brainstorming session, and I wanted to do everything to be sharp for this meeting. So I remember drinking some ginkgo tea and taking some amino acid stimulants and wearing yellow, which is the color of cerebral stimulus, and putting rosemary essential oil in my hair, because rosemary is for remembrance. And I sat there in this meeting and had this brainstorm where I, I said, oh, I've got it. Mental clarity, immunity, serenity, you know, mental clarity, immunity, serenity, purity, digestibility, sensuality, maternity. And um, Tom came to pick me up at the end of the day and I said, honey, we're going to start a tea company. And we did it on very little financing, um, but we had the tea company for 16 years, Unity Herbs, and Tom pretty much ran it because I kept my job at Alfalfa, so it was really Tom that made it grow and... Well, Brigitte is definitely the idea machine. She comes up with all kinds of ideas, and I'm the nuts and bolts guy. I'm the guy who's got to put those ideas into the world and manifest them. And uh, she had this idea, and I thought, well, this is very intriguing. So I said, well, make up a couple of pounds of it, take it to the store, and see how it goes. Well, it was gone in an hour. I said, we'll make a few more pounds and we'll take it to the store. And it was gone in the same hour. So, you know, it didn't take too many lights to go off. I said, well, you know, there's some potential here. So well, we started on a shoestring and we were wearing sandals at the time and um, put, just started making it happen. And uh, the marketplace was pulling what we were making as fast as we could make it. So we just kept making it. We started in a living room in a house over on 18th Street that we lived in for a number of years. And uh, it grew, it outgrew the living room rather quickly. And then we went into a place down at the uh, west end of the mall and were there for 16 years in the marketplace. Had, a, had an amazingly good time doing it, uh, provided what we thought was a very good uh, product for people nationwide. And um, yeah, in some regards, I have no idea how we pulled it off. We never really had the budget to do it, but uh, blood, sweat, tears, hope, desire, truth, belief, and we did it. And you never had fears about uh, it being a go and being successful, and you just kept 
plugging away at it and it just grew and grew. It just kept growing and it became a way to support our family, which was a wonderful thing for me. I was looking for something to do anyway. I was at the tail end of one career that had been very good to me for 15, 16 years before. But uh, in order to continue there, we had to move about the country. And once we found Boulder, we didn't want to move about the mm -hmm. country anymore. We were very happy to be here. Uh, we've been here now how long? 20, 25 years, 26 years, something like that. Uh, I think Brigitte is the closest thing to a living, walking monument that Boulder has, and she definitely represents Boulder. I think she's everything that Boulder's ever been about, and, um, and uh, why would we want to leave here? When you say that you um, put together a batch of tea and brought it to the store, do you mean alfalfas? Yes. And did you have it in bulk? In bulk, big gallon jars. And, and people just, bought it and people bought it and it yeah they did and we created other teas and we sold the tea company five years ago so it's not something that um, you know stayed in our control the health food industry as you probably know has changed many little mom and pop companies have been bought out by big corporate giants mm -hmm. so it was time and uh, the people that bought it didn't really do well with it they put energy into other products that they were creating. Although we hope that soon someone else might take hope it over. We're able to revitalize yeah. the company. So and, that might happen. And speaking of the historical aspect of it, we were in the Boulder Historical Museum some time back. Um, I guess it was a couple of years ago, and we were looking at things in that museum and ran up on on, on a tin of tea called Purity from some company uh, 70, 80 years ago. So it just seems like these ideas recycle themselves from time mm -hmm. to time, and uh, um, we thought that was kind of. Uh, how, what was the time frame between when you brought gallon jars of the tea over to Alfalfa's and you actually started packaging it and uh, selling it in these tins? That, we would have been in bulk for about the first 12 years, I think. We were only a bulk herb company for 12 years. Amazing that we ever got in the marketplace, amazing that we were able to stay in the marketplace, and there's that's a testament to two things in my in my view, and one is that the product was good, but once again, Brigitte could sell icicles to Eskimos. I mean, people love Brigitte. Uh, she she was an herbalist here in town. There's a lot of awareness about herbal medicine here in town, and people were coming to her and they said, "Well, how much of this do I use, and how do I put it together, and which ingredients?" And that's what really stimulated her to come up with a very simple way for people to make use of herb teas on a medicinal or therapeutic level. And then it was just a matter of once the idea was there and once the demand was there, well, start making it. And that's what we did. Who designed the canisters? A, a local artist named George Tuffy, who lives up in Wall Street. And, um, he did the art. He did the art, although we gave him the ideas. But he mm -hmm. really would take the ideas and do something beautiful. Quite a remarkable artist, a friend, friend of ours from Austria. And we would go to him with a concept, with an idea, and we'd go back up there three or four days later, and there it was. And of the uh, 15 or 16 paintings that we asked him to do, we only had to redo, I think, one. Mm -hmm. He would take the idea, put it on uh, canvas, and there it was. And we were just astonished. We'd go to him with a concept, and he'd come out with art. Uh -huh. phenomenal. Did Unity ever go national? Unity did go national. We were in all 50 states and in Canada, and there were inquiries to Europe. It was very difficult to do business in Europe, and we were a small company. It was hard to get in with all of the import-export that's necessary to go beyond Canada. But in all 50 states and Canada. Mm -hmm. And how did you experience being a small business owner in Boulder? As a small business owner in Boulder does experience small business in Boulder, Boulder is a very difficult and tough business environment. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, Boulder wasn't really the controlling factor, the control, aside from rent and places, things such as that. I mean, it was more the marketplace. It was the, we had entered into an industry that was hungry for products. So we were in a very friendly environment to produce products for retailers across the nation. So we had one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of the people at the retailers. It wasn't about distributors, it wasn't about corporation, it wasn't about slotting fees. It was a very friendly kind of business environment at that time. 
uh, as you know now, it, it's more corporatized. It's uh, it's not nearly as personal. But I, you know, we had 1,600 accounts, and we could generally know the person by first name that we were speaking to. So Boulder didn't have a huge effect upon uh, it. was more of a national pull into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And did the um, increasing move towards uh, a more corporate flavor influence your decision to sell the tea company? Absolutely. There, mm -hmm. that, that was the problem. Uh, the corporatization and the uh, homogenization of, of, of small businesses just ran a lot of small business people out of town. You may recall there were a lot of small health food store, mom and pop shop kind of businesses in that environment. The handy, the handy grocery store, who was some of the Boulder. others, Crystal Market, you know, all these kind of little independently owned places have all been replaced by conglomerates now, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, and so for every of one of those conglomerates that opened a store, three, four, five, six of those small stores went out of business, well, those were our customers, so, you know, the corporatization and, and the uh, uh, homogenization of business put a lot of small business people out. It was just impossible to compete. Uh, we couldn't afford the slotting fees that the, the new conglomerates were charging. They had to pay for the right to be on the shelf, this, that, and other. So it was a little difficult in the sense that, you know, the people who actually created the industry, they created the marketplace based upon making the products and making the industry viable, were eventually shoved up. But I think that's just the way every, every industry works at some point. So is Unity still in existence? Unity, the intellectual property, is still in existence. Uh, we are currently having some conversations with a few parties to perhaps bring them back into the marketplace. Uh, but in the marketplace, they are non-existent at this point. Okay. Brigitte, what prompted you to write your first book, and which was your first book? My first book was actually a book on elder elder trees and it was interesting I had just come back from picking elder berries which Tom and I love to do in the fall and I had a phone call from Keats Publishing saying would you like to write a book on uh, the healing powers of elder berries and elder flowers and so that was my first book and did you what how what was your response when you got this phone call did you immediately jump right into it yes and we made elderflower champagne and elderberry chutney and it was so fun creating all these recipes and becoming some of, of an expert on this one particular plant and uh, then i wrote a little book herbs for healthy skin hair and nails and both of those books have uh, gone out of print because the publishing companies that published them were bought out by bigger publishing companies that had, you know, other targets. But um, three books that I have out right now that are all um, in print and doing quite well, Addiction Free Naturally, I was asked to write uh, that one. And I, I was really glad for that opportunity because I've often felt that when someone has a health condition and you recommend some herbs or some dietary changes, if they're still addicted to tobacco, alcohol, coffee, sugar, that might really get in the way of them achieving true health. So I wrote Addiction Free Naturally, and that came out, I'm gonna say like 1999. And then Sex, Love, and Health was a joy to write because being married for so long, I want to learn more about the arts of love from other cultures and Tom and I took a number of tantric workshops and I wanted to write a book that not only talked about the art of love but holistic gynecology that would include natural ways for dealing with menopause and prostate health and uh, endometriosis and uh, it was a real joyous book to write I believe that came out in 2001 and my latest book is Rawsome that just came out in 2004 and it's already in its third printing, even though it's only been out for s about six months. And uh, the raw foods movement is really growing, and I'm so glad I wrote this book because I, I love being part of this movement. How did you become involved in the raw foods movement? Well, I thought about raw foods a little bit in the 70s when I lived in Miami and had a vegetarian restaurant there. And when I moved to Colorado and I talked about raw foods, everyone said, 
you can't eat raw foods. Uh, you're crazy. It's too cold here. So I quickly gave up the whole idea of eating raw foods, and I studied macrobiotics with Aveline and Michio Kushi and Rebecca Wood, and um, enjoyed macrobiotics, which is you know brown rice and beans and seaweeds and all kinds of great grains and vegetables. But a few years ago, my daughter, Rainbow, I'm actually looking for um, a picture of her, Rainbow Mars, uh, my daughter Rainbow, when she went to Hollywood after making her first movie uh, and became quite adept at doing yoga, called and said, Mom, I've gone raw. And I thought, oh no, this is some sort of anorexic thing that these young kids do out there, God help her. And uh, we went out there to talk some sense into her. And when we saw her, we said, well, she looks really good. And my husband had already always had digestive problems. And uh, we were worried about the raw diet. But after trying her roommate's meals, her roommate was Giuliano, a raw chef and author of raw and owner of a restaurant called Raw in LA. She said, don't worry, my roommate is a raw chef and he knows all about it. So I decided that I was going to try it for a year just to be supportive of my daughter. And after about a month, I felt so good that I just wanted to keep on going with it. So sorry, I'm looking, uh, since I showed you a picture of Rainbow, I wanted to put my daughter Sunflower Sparkles picture here as well. Bless her heart. I'm so grateful. And I get to be a grandmother. It's the greatest thing now. So I decided that I was going to try raw foods for a year and after a month I just said I feel younger I feel like I can dance like I did when I was 17 I feel like I sing better my vision is better and my husband has actually had his eyeglass prescription reduced three times in the past three years so I'm really convinced that it's a great thing to do and people who think that they've tried everything to improve their health should try raw foods because mm -hmm. it saves time, it saves energy, it saves money, and you can have absolutely wonderful, delicious food. So I, I just want to talk about it all the time these days. Being in Boulder for the last 28 years myself, I have seen the comings and goings of so many vegetarian restaurants, the Little Kitchen and the Carnival Cafe and the Heartland Cafe and probably some others I can't think of. Why can't a community like Boulder uh, support a vegetarian restaurant? I think that when people go out to dinner, you might have a couple vegetarians and then a couple people who want non-vegetarian meals. So we do have Sunflower, which will offer many vegetarian entrees. And, you know, there's more and more restaurants that do offer vegetarian entrees. So I think it's the dynamics of, you know, when you have a party of six, you know, the two vegetarians end up going to where everybody else wants to eat. And uh, just as you have seen, Joyce, lots of trends, you know, vegetarianism has been trendy. And then uh, I ate meat for a number of years because it was available organically. And now I'm back to being a, a vegan, a raw foods vegan. So it's interesting to see all the trends. But um, I would love to see a raw foods restaurant open in Boulder, and I hope that someone does it. People keep asking me, when are you going to open a restaurant? And I feel that for now my path is to teach people how to do it themselves because, you know, I've had two restaurants in the past, and restaurants are an everyday kind of deal, and I know how much work they are. So I'm really grateful to the people that are doing a, a great job with the restaurants. And, um, I'm also happy about the little cart Sally's on the Raw on Pearl Street Mall that's closed down for the uh, fall and winter season, but hopefully will reopen in the spring. Sally Taylor has a little Raw Volkswagen van on Pearl Street Mall. But yes, maybe um, it'll happen. For listeners who might not know the connection, uh, Sally Taylor is James Taylor, the famous musician, singer, songwriter's daughter. Yep, and Carly Simon's daughter as well. Uh -huh. And she's, uh, Sally Taylor's a wonderful musician in her own right. Uh, I understand that you don't drive a car. How has that been in Boulder where people are, seem very attached to their autos? You know, I, I really just never learned to drive. When 
most kids were having driver's ed. I went to an all-girls boarding school, and they didn't have driver's ed there. And then I lived in the Virgin Islands, and there were very few cars there back then, mostly um, mopeds. And um, when I lived on the commune in Missouri, the four-wheel drive roads were so treacherous, only the brave would uh, attempt to drive something like that. And when I've lived in Boulder, people always assume, because I'm an herbalist, I live in the mountains. Uh, but, you know, I don't drive, so I don't want to live in the mountains. I love to go up to the mountains. Uh, my husband likes to say I don't need to drive because I'm driven, um, that I'm self-motivated. Uh, uh, where I live, right downtown, is such a great location. I love that Boulder Co-op is right across the street. I love that I can walk to Naropa, that I can walk to Pharmaca. I work at both Pharmacas these days. Um, and most of what I need is right in town. If I need to go to the airport, I walk to 14th and Walnut and take the bus. And people say to me, you know, how can you stand night driving? It would take so much longer. If I need to go teach at the massage school in Gun Barrel, I'll go take the bus if I don't have a ride. People say it takes so much longer to take uh, the bus. And I say, how many more hours a week do you need to work to pay for your car, to pay for your gas, your insurance, your car repairs? My guess is I save time by not driving than you do by driving.